Hi, I'm John Mark Young, President and Chief Investment Officer of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers, and I'd like to welcome you to another installment of the Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers, What We Learned in the Markets This Week video. Perhaps the Where's Waldo version of What We Learned in the Markets based on my t-shirt. Now, our aim is to provide you, our valued clients, with a brief video giving you information that's helpful to your understanding of the markets and what happened this last week, while also drowning out the agenda of the news media in America. So let's talk about the four things we think we learned this week. Point number one, Federal Reserve, what? The stock market finally ended its three-week slide by capping off a strong performance on Friday. The Dow Jones Industrial added about 2.66% for the week, while the S&P 500 gained 3.65%, and the tech-heavy or more growth fund NASDAQ gained 4.14%. Over the last three weeks, even against a backdrop of positive economic reports and, and pretty good quarter two earnings from companies, the market continued to fall in a kind of good news is actually bad news scenario because it meant the Fed will have to be more aggressive with interest rates. However, this week the S&P 500 reclaimed an important technical measure by surpassing its 50-day moving average. And next Tuesday is going to be a huge test when the consumer price index is released, which, of course, that's gauging the inflation that, that happened uh, this last month. Point number two, and let's stay on the trend of inflation, which, again, is coming out next Tuesday. The Cleveland Federal Reserve, they maintain an economic metric model that estimates the consumer price index on a daily real-time basis. The mythology on how they come to this, it's a little more complicated than this, but let me break it down to its base level. And that is taking last month's data and adjusting it for gasoline and crude oil prices, which are, are highly volatile. In June, for example, their model, the Cleveland Fed's model, predicted headline inflation and headline, remember, tracks the total inflation of the market. They predicted 8% and it came in at 9.1%, a difference of... 1.1%. Conversely, in June, they predicted core inflation, and core inflation strips out the volatile parts of inflation, like food and energy. They predicted that to be at 6.1, and it came in at 5.9%, a difference of only 0.2. In July, their model estimated 7.5% headline inflation and 6.9% core inflation, while the numbers actually came in at 8.5% and 5.9%, a difference of 1% each, respectively. Their August estimates are 5.5% headline inflation and 6.1% core inflation. Using their range of error for the last two months, you get a 6.5% headline and a 6.7% core inflation number. A lot of the numbers here, but let's reset. The Cleveland Fed is expecting inflation to come down dramatically on Tuesday based on their inflation economic model, and we'd expect those numbers to be in the 6% range Excuse me, when released. Let's see how the markets react to a lower inflation number. But last month, when inflation came in a little lower, the market rallied pretty good. Point number three, let's continue to stay on theme here. And the theme being Federal Reserve economic models. Do you remember earlier videos earlier this year where I discussed the Atlanta Fed's GDP model? This model estimates the expected GDP, gross domestic product, which we use to estimate the size of the U.S. economy, and earlier in the summer, the Atlanta Fed's GDP model estimated a negative second quarter reading when no one else was predicting that. And I'm going to do my best John Madden here. Boom! GDP came in, and just as they predicted it in the Atlanta Fed model, negative. And we met the technical definition of recession, two negative quarters. Well, now the Atlanta Fed is estimating third quarter GDP to come in at positive 2.6% on an after-inflation basis. Quarter one was negative 1.6, and quarter two was negative 0.6. So this is very exciting to see this pretty accurate estimate confirming our economy is, he is handling inflation and higher interest rates pretty good and continue to grow. And point number four, China, China, they seem to be a mess right now. The government has a zero COVID policy, and that has repeated in ongoing lockdowns, which is crippling the second largest economy in the world. Their housing market, uh, which, you know, that housing market, along with the Chinese bond market, 
are the two primary drivers of retirement savings in that country is seeing its largest downturn on record. And as such, their currency, the yuan, is quickly tumbling against the dollar to around 7 yuan per US dollar. The government controls the Chinese currency, unlike the US currency, which is allowed to freely free market flow. And this means the Chinese government is trying to make their goods cheaper around the world by devaluing their currency. This would make Chinese exports cheaper to bring to the US. And is that gonna be enough to bring back this very important economic engine? Or are they beginning to lose a little bit of their steam they've had over the last 20 years and heading in the wrong direction? Something we're gonna be watching very, very closely as well. If you have any questions about the way the market or, or what we're talking about today impacts your personal situation, please feel free to reach out to one of our advisors by clicking the schedule a meeting button in the notes here or visiting our website at whitakerwealth.com. Conversely, you can always check out our blog section to read the articles we've written this last week, which always has timely, important financial planning and market related information. We thank you so much for watching the video and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks so much.